Welcome to today's issue of the Digital Health Jungle. I'm very excited to be here with my friend, Medell briggs Melanson, who is the Chief Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UCLA Hospital and Clinic System and an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. Medell, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Stephen, thank you so much for the invitation. And I too look forward to our discussion. Let me just introduce myself and I'm going to go a little bit more into Medell's background. My name is Dr. Stephen Lane. I'm the chief medical officer at Health Gorilla and a practicing primary care physician with more than 30 years of background in clinical informatics. And today we're going to be talking together about all the ways that health data access and interoperability can support or potentially impede equity. So Medell is a perfect person to have here today to talk about this. Medell's career has been focused on innovative healthcare system redesign to advance health equity within diverse communities. Through her health disparities research, lectures on social drivers of health and bias in medicine, and advocacy to recruit and retain more women and people of color in academic medicine, Medell has continued to increase awareness of how diversity within the healthcare workforce plays a critical role in eliminating health inequities. In addition to her academic responsibility, she's also the founder and CEO of Contour Health Solutions, which is a national advisory firm that partners with health technology organizations to achieve high performance and value by implementing solutions that improve the quality, safety, and efficiency of medical services for diverse populations. That is an amazing background, Medell. I only know a bit about what you've been doing. So I'm really, again, excited that we're here to talk about this all today. Thank you. Again, really looking forward to our conversation. And thank you for the warm introduction as well. We're going to kick off our conversation with really an acknowledgement that I wanted to share that every individual's personal history really informs their experience and understanding of equity. Uh, so I thought I'd start actually by sharing my own background, as this, I think, really does inform the perspective and potential biases that I bring to the discussion, and then I'm going to invite you to do the same. Just a little bit about me. I'm a descendant of historically persecuted Ashkenazi immigrants. I was raised in the 1960s and 70s by working class parents in the context of the civil and equal rights movements. I benefited from a high quality progressive public education and then went on to spend my career as a physician in large public, academic, and nonprofit health systems. So while my immediate members of my family have definitely been impacted by gender discrimination and our unfortunate culture of sexual misconduct, I have not personally been a victim of any major traumas, negative prejudice societal oppression, socioeconomic restrictions. I'm incredibly grateful for the privilege and good fortune that I've enjoyed, but it makes me really aware of the importance of remaining curious and open to learning about the experience and the experience of oppression that that, that others feel. That's what I bring to this discussion. Medell, obviously you, you and I have lots of similarities and lots of differences. So I, I'd love you to talk a bit about your personal and professional background and how it's informed your perspective on it. First, I want to say thank you, Stephen, for even starting off this discussion with that, because you're absolutely right. All of our lived experiences completely shape how we see the world, how we interact with the world, and also what we bring to this world. And so a little bit about my own personal background. I am the child of two educators, but two educators that grew up up in the Jim Crow South. So they grew up at a time where there was whites only and coloreds only, where they went to segregated schools, they could not drink from the same water fountains. And that actually helped to shape who they were in terms of really making sure that they were also advocates for social justice. And so my parents are two amazing people and as mentioned educators. So they are first generation college as well as graduate school graduates. And so, for instance, my father with a PhD, my mother with multiple masters. So growing up as a child, education was always at the center in our family. And really making sure that we give back to our communities was always part of our family's focus. And so as I grew up, I really did not have any needs in my mind. So when I was sick, I went to go see the physicians. When I, there was always food on the table, there was always clothes. So I actually grew up in a very supportive and privileged background. 
But one of the things that, that my parents always taught me is that we should always make sure that we're friends with people of various different backgrounds, faiths, cultures, race, ethnicity. So my friends were incredibly diverse and they were especially diverse when it came to socioeconomic status. So I still remember to this day when I was in junior high and I remember one of my very close friends, she said to me, she was like, oh, I'm not feeling well. And I was like, why don't you just go to the doctor. She was like, I don't have access to a doctor. We would have to go to a clinic and it literally takes days. And even as a child, I was like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Why don't you have direct access to go and see someone if you're feeling sick? And that was my first clear evidence of the significant health inequities that exist, not only for people of color, but also for people of very similar social economic status. And that sort of was the first bit of a fire that was lit in me. And so moving on throughout my entire personal, and then it goes into my professional life, I am the very first physician in my family. And there are several nurses, but I am the very first physician. And the other seed that was planted in me, and I still remember this day as well, I was about five years old. And my aunt, who's a nurse, I was playing with her stethoscope one day after we had dinner. And I was playing with her stethoscope and listening to my own heart. And she came over and she said, sweetheart, do you want to be a doctor when you grow up? And for me, I was like, doctor, what? great. That sounds like a wonderful profession. Why not? But it was critical what she said. She was a nurse and she didn't say, do you want to be a nurse when you grow up? She said, do you want to be a doctor when you grow up? Because even then, what my aunt was saying is that she recognized the lack of not only women physicians, but definitely Black women physicians within our country. And from that moment on, I was on the track to becoming a doctor. But of course, things have gotten a lot more involved and a lot more intentional since I was five or since I was in middle school. And part of one of the things that I have always been raised in and what now I instill in my children is that when you are provided with sources of power and privilege, it is your responsibility to also give back and to serve. And so my main focus has always been on really addressing the needs of our most under resource communities and thinking about not only their healthcare needs, but also all the various different social needs that they need. And so that has actually allowed me to enter into the profession of emergency medicine, because for me, being an emergency doctor is really seeing the looking through the window of our society and being able to see both the physical ills and the social ills of our society. But then also my public health background when thinking about populations and communities and how we can improve it. And now in terms of my health IT background, knowing that we live in such a digital world and knowing that everyone of all backgrounds, race, ethnicity, gender identity, social economic status, we all have access to various different forms of technology. So how can we use that technology in order to improve people's overall health and well-being? So that's just a little bit about some of my why and some of the reasons why I do what I do and also the vision of one day as we all come together, Stephen, as you mentioned, with all of our various different backgrounds, we can absolutely ensure both not only equity, but overall health and social justice for all people that live within our country, but also throughout the world. Adele, you are so articulate. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for putting all that out there. That's great. So let's build on these, our backgrounds and our perspectives, which again, are have many similarities and many differences and drill down a, li a little bit more on equity because it, it's a term that I think some people have a hard time explaining. I've, you and I have each given talks with slides of people on bicycles or people at the baseball stadium or whatnot. But in our work, we work in, as you say, health IT and we think about health data and how we can leverage that to improve equity. But I'd like to hear your definitions and maybe reflections on the differences between health equity, health care equity, and health data equity, and how we can think about those to try to move this conversation forward. Yeah, and those are all three very important concepts for everyone to understand if we are going to move this forward. And even before I get in quickly to what you mentioned for health equity, health care equity, and health data equity, I think it's really important for us all to understand there's a difference between even equity 
and equality. And that's the main area that I think most people get confused about or either conflate the two ideas with the idea that equality, which is what we have been promoting for decades, is just that assumption that everyone's going to benefit from the same exact thing. But the truth is, we're not all the same. Our situations are not all the same. Our lived experiences are not all the same. And therefore, we cannot assume that one thing that's going to work for one person or one population is going to work for the other. And one way that I always like to explain this is that I wear size seven shoes and I love high heel shoes. But Stephen, if I gave you my size seven shoes that are high heels, I'm not quite sure that you would be that happy in them. And I'm not quite sure that you're going to be able to walk around that much in them as well. But the assumption that just because high heel size seven shoes work for me, that they're going to work for you is obviously an erroneous assumption. And that's what we're really trying to differentiate between equality and equity first. So getting a little bit more into some of the other definitions as you mentioned. So health equity, I actually like to describe health equity as the ability for everyone to have a fair and just opportunity to achieve optimal health. But in order to achieve optimal health, that means that we have to address all of the other factors, such as the social drivers of health, that include things such as fair job wages, access to education, the health services that somebody has access to, the environment and the safety of that environment, food security, the list goes on and on, because these are all the things that contribute to who we are and how healthy we can be. And so health equity is making sure that there's not any advantages or disadvantages solely because of who the person is, where they may live, and then of course, where they may work, play, practice their religion or any other factors in our society. So that's how I like to describe health equity, when which there's a fair and just opportunity for everyone to achieve optimal health by addressing all of these other complex factors. And then there's health care equity. And healthcare equity is, I feel, a lot of times what we discuss more within our settings of clinical care delivery. So within our clinics, within our hospitals, within our emergency departments. And this is really the way I like to describe it, the provision of healthcare services based on an individual's or a population's needs in order to ensure that they too, and you notice these common words, have a fair and just opportunity to achieve optimal healthcare outcomes. So what does that mean? That means that if I'm providing a certain level of care to one person, I'm making sure that I'm also providing that same level of care that is necessary for the next person as well. But this also includes making sure that we're taking a step back, looking at the data, are there any differences between patient populations, whether that's by race or gender identity, language, ability status, or payer status? And if there are, what are we doing about it? So healthcare equity is really focused on the delivery of those healthcare services, which may actually change depending on what that individual's needs are or what that population's needs are. And then the last one that you were mentioning of health data equity, and I also like to push this one and really talk about health data justice. And the idea behind data equity and justice in particular is I like just to describe it as ensuring that all the data that we are collecting and utilizing is actually done in an equitable manner. So what does that also mean? When we're thinking about collection of data, are we collecting it directly from our patients or directly from the community? Or are we making assumptions about people's identity or people's lived situation? I use this example pretty often and my father-in-law has actually given me permission for that. My father-in-law is Creole and self-identifies as Black. But if you were just to look at his outward appearance, many people have made the erroneous assumption that he is actually white. And in his medical record about now, about a year and a half or so ago, in his medical record, it was listed came all the way throughout his medical record that he was a white male. And he came to me, he was like, why does everybody keep on thinking I'm white? And I was like, oh, honestly, because of your skin complexion. But he said, no one has ever asked me how I identify. 
And I was like, and you know what, dad, that's the problem. And so many of us throughout the country are trying to change that. So that goes back into data equity as well as data justice. Are we really centering the people that we have to serve? And then also when it comes to justice, making sure that this data that we're collecting is not used in an inappropriate way. So making sure that as we collect data, especially big data or public health data, that it's not inadvertently actually causing more marginalization of some of our most vulnerable populations. And whether that's in artificial intelligence, machine learning, or just as we're analyzing the data that may lead to other inappropriate assumptions. So those are just a few definitions that I like to use for health equity, health care equity, as well as health data equity and justice. That's great. It's interesting because I thought in a health data equity that you would talk more about access to data and the mm -hmm. availability of data, but your focus was more on the use of the data. Because there's so many other issues about privacy, about being able to, as I say, access and utilize data that exists, which is clearly inequitably distributed across the population. But Stephen, you bring up a really good point. That's another piece of data justice as well, making sure that those that do need the data actually do have access to it in every way. So yes, without a doubt, I tend to... Oftentimes, as you'll notice when we have the conversation, I am very slanted towards really centering our people and our populations and as much as possible. But exactly as you said, if we're trying to provide services, whether it's health services, public health services, or social services, we need to all make sure that the people that need that data, especially some of our areas that are more of our safety net providers, without a doubt, have access to that data. So great point to add into that data equity and justice piece, too. Yeah. And then the other point that comes to my mind is in rural areas or outlying sure. areas where you may not have broadband, you may not have penetrance of technology, hardware, the tools that are really needed to leverage that. So those yeah. are all great points. Let's transition a little bit over to, as you mentioned earlier, SDOH, which you referred to as the social drivers of health. There's a lot here again, I think the terminology trips people up. And I think it's important if we're going to really leverage SDOH to, to create the kinds of changes we want to see in equity, that we have some shared definitions. So I've heard people speak about social and structural, and then also behavioral determinants of, of health. And then as you use the term, not determinants, but drivers, which I think is a great word. I actually, I think I learned that from you and I've been using it myself now because I think it really does capture the fact that this is not all predetermined. That these things change all the time. Sometimes moment to moment. If I get hit by a bus or if my house gets repossessed or if I win the lottery, the drivers of my health are changing quickly. So I'm curious when you use the term SDOH, how do you define those terms and what does that imbue there? So Stephen, I think that this is such an important conversation because yes, the term SDOH is thrown out all over the place. And the term that I like to use, as we've discussed before, and I love what you just mentioned, so thank you for that, is social structural drivers of health. And specifically, the reason why I like to use the term drivers versus determinants is just as you mentioned, because the idea when you think about determinants, there's just this feeling when you use that word that these factors that directly influence health and overall well-being are fixed and static and you can't change them whatsoever. It's almost like we're all born with certain determinants and so that's just your situation. But we know that's not the case. So when it comes to the social structural drivers are dynamic. Drivers can be modified. Drivers may change from, as you mentioned, day to day or month to month, but definitely can easily change from year to year. And I also think that there is a glass half full kind of mantra behind drivers, because especially for those of us in healthcare and health IT, and who are really focused on serving and improving population health, community health, if something's static and fixed, how can we influence that? But we know that we do play a significant role in influencing these areas. So that's why they're drivers. And so the other reason why I like to use the term social structural is because it combines both the social aspects of these factors that contribute to health and 
the structural, because there's human behavior that goes into this. There's the societal conditions, as well as like processes and procedures that exist within our society. But then there's also true physical structures. So for instance, if you're a family that's living in a multi-generational dwelling, and maybe you only have one room, one bedroom or two bedrooms max, but there's seven to 10 people living there, your health situation and condition will most likely be very different than someone that is living in a much larger home, that it's just one family. And so we saw that a lot during the pandemic, where we saw that people that lived in smaller dwellings multi-generational smaller dwellings had a higher risk of actually contracting COVID because of the inability to isolate or quarantine if somebody was exposed or contracted the COVID virus. So that's how all of these factors play in, which is why I like to use the term social structural drivers. And, and I know, Stephen, we've talked about this a lot in terms of what those are. And there's a combination of different SDOHs that people tend to use. I like to really focus on seven primary ones. One, economic stability. Two, overall access to high quality care. Three, the physical environment, meaning everything that is built around an individual or where they live, including environmental justice, really focusing on toxins food security, community and social context. And that involves everything ab about our social connections with people, all the way to including racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination, which we know plays a direct impact on people's health and well-being. Access to social services or healthcare services, excuse me, being the sixth item. But then last but not least, technology. Because as you were mentioning with data justice, really having accessibility to the type of technology and especially health technology that we are promoting is really critical to one's overall health and especially self-management. So technology is a huge SDOH that oftentimes we do not focus on enough. And we really need to really start thinking about how we ensure that our technology is not only accessible, equitable, but that also that really all of our people are being able to use it the way that they need to in order to benefit from it. Wow. Yes, that 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 was a great list of kind of domains, if you will, the social and structural drivers of health. And I've heard others mentioned as well. There, there are a lot of people who are working in this space. I wanted to talk a little bit about the sources of this data, because you mentioned a lot of different data domains or data classes there that it can be hard to get at that data. I think we, we all know that there's a lot of efforts going on now to collect data directly from individuals, either in the healthcare setting the social setting, or perhaps using technology. And, uh, and there's work being done by the Gravity Project and others to really define what are the best instruments and surveys to use to collect that data. There's also a number of what have been defined as indices or scores that have been put together by various groups based on geography. If you look at this geography, be it a zip code or a census track or what have you, we, you can say on average people who live work, worship in this domain are going to have certain health characteristics. And then there are other EOH type scores that are being developed that involve publicly available data. So you can look at all kinds of data about me or you and learn about our education, learn about our income, learn about what's gone on with us with the Department of Motor Vehicles or the justice system or the banking system. So there are a number of different sources of data. Talk a little bit about the pros, cons, and utility of those. And then we'll also get into some of the risks associated with different data sources. Yeah, and that list that you just mentioned about all of the different data sources, it's overwhelming now because when we all started this journey, and this is something a little bit more about my background that I didn't really go too much into, but my background's really in quality and patient safety. And the reason why I started my professional career in quality and patient safety was because back in the day, we really didn't have people that were focused on health equity. Equity has been defined as one of the core six principles for providing high quality care. And that was defined over 20 plus years ago by the Institute of Medicine. But it's for me, as somebody who's been in this area for decades now and has focused and committed her profession to really 
addressing those factors that lead to inequitable care and inequitable outcomes of various different patient populations, especially our more under-resourced, vulnerable patient populations and our low-income communities of color. It's just fascinating now and which now we're starting to gather all of this different data so that we can start looking at patients more holistically in order to really address what their, both their healthcare and their social needs are. And so even as you just mentioned, like all the different data sources we now have and all the efforts from the Gravity Project to so many others, it's very heartening. It makes me very happy, but it's also, we have to proceed with intention and caution or else our good intentions may actually unintentionally have a negative impact on those populations that we're actually trying to help the most. So I feel like the gold standard for collecting data is really directly from the individuals. Too often, we have made assumptions in healthcare about an individual situation, about their identities, about what they may like, their preferences, and their optimal experiences. And I feel that one of the most important things in all ways possible is to obtain this SGOH data directly from the patients. But we know that's not always possible. And that may not be possible due to just the overall screening process and the time that it takes and how to design appropriate screening questions that are going to give us the information that we need. The other factor is trust. We have a long history of medical racism within our country, as well as other forms of discrimination within healthcare. So trust, and especially among various different populations, may not be there. So giving additional information out outside of your standard healthcare information may not be something that some people or populations may want to do. So there are those challenges there. And then I think another piece of it is, will our patients, regardless of who they are, are they going to give us the right information? So I think that's still the gold standard is to get it directly from our patients, but understanding that there are some challenges that we may have to try to get over, or at least try to reconcile from our history that, and that we just have to work through building those trusting relationships. Now, because we can't always get the information from the individual patients, as you mentioned, a lot of the risk indices are, I think, a great tool for us to actually start utilizing in order to understand the potential community or environment that our patients may be coming from. And so the area deprivation index score, the social deprivation index score, the social vulnerability index score, which I'll be very honest, that's my favorite one, just because it's been so highly validated and used by the CDC. And then, as you mentioned, the local social inequity scores. And then there's others that several states have as well. And so I think these are excellent proxies at a community level. So if you have an individual, let's say I walk into my physician's office and they don't know anything about me, but they can actually pull out my zip code and they can run it on the census track and say, okay, the Dell lives in this area. We know that this is already present in our area. This is the composition of our area. So if we are going to recommend certain medications or certain social services or whatever that may be, we know what's around her. So while it's not a one-for-one -one match, I do think it's a wonderful tool for us to use these indices to say, is someone living in a community that's more vulnerable, that is under-resourced? And if so, what that means is that we're going to have to increase our support or increase our services for them. Because if someone's living, let's say, in a highly socially vulnerable community, and I say, here's a prescription. I want you to go to your local pharmacy and fill this prescription. But we know that they live in an area in which there's not many pharmacies. Before that person leaves my emergency department or leaves the hospital, we're going to bring the medications to them, or we're going to arrange a mail order system for them to ensure that they don't have any barriers of getting this very important medication. So that's how it can really be used in order to make sure that we are still promoting and advancing equity for those that do live in some of our most under-resourced areas. And then the other newest area that I know that Health Gorilla is really a leader in right now and working directly with some of these entities like LexisNexis or some of those other pieces that she mentioned in terms of bringing in other types of data sources. And so I think that they have potential, but I will be honest, these are the ones that I 
have more pause on and I have to reflect upon as well because I think this all goes back to the idea of data justice and which is really focused on if I'm gathering this information and gathering this information from various different data sources, number one, why am I gathering this information? Number two, what am I going to use this information for? And then what I would say is number three, how do I ensure that this data that I'm bringing in or I'm looking at does not unintentionally marginalize even more some of our most vulnerable populations? And especially because a lot of the data sources are not connected data sources. So friends, if you're pulling in from DMV or if you're pull pulling in from credit reports or you're pulling in from all these other factors, there are different snapshots in time of patients or of various different populations. And so that's why I would say this is the area that has potential, but we need to proceed very cautiously in order to really understand why we need the information, how to use that information, and also to make sure that it's not causing additional harm. I think you make a really good point. And one of them was the point you made earlier that Mostly at this point in time, we can and should use this data to identify people who may have additional needs for service, right? May have, uh, may benefit from more outreach, from more support, from more offers, be it the medication delivery, as you said, or rides or, you know, meal services, et cetera. So I think that's a very good point. The way that I see it and what I think we're going to see happening at Health Gorilla and in other so settings is bringing all of this data together. Because as you said, there are real challenges collecting the data directly from the patient. There are challenges of getting the patient to consent to sharing the data that they may share in confidence in that trusting setting. So I think if we can bring all of these data sources together and create a, a dashboard of social drivers information that can be seen in context with the health data, that's going to allow providers, social care agencies, and others to probably do the most good and ideally avoid harm in this approach. Agree, agree. And again, the one thing that I would just recommend, do a double check, meaning as these things are being built out, just literally have that intentional check of saying, are we excluding anyone? Or can this unintentionally cause harm to any of the additional populations? And specifically, really focus on some of our most vulnerable population, meaning those that are living with various different disabilities, those that have various different languages, those that live in lower social economic communities, just really intentionally saying, as we're bringing this data together, as we're creating these dashboards with all good faith, is there, are there any unintentional consequences that we can foresee? And if so, let's fix them now. Yeah, that's a great point. And I wanted to mention that, as you and I both know, the Gravity Project is working yes. with the ONC and sponsoring a number of very specific implementation pilots where we're starting to see the results of the real world collection and exchange and use of this data. So what have you learned from that process so far? And what do you hope that we can learn? Because that seems like that opportunity to do that double check that you're describing. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And I think the Gravity Project and all the teams that are behind the Gravity Project have been doing a fantastic job. And truly pioneers, we're breaking through some of these initial barriers in order to see and make sure that we're able to incorporate SDOH data in a more meaningful and relevant manner. So very excited to even see all the different outcomes, especially of all the different pilot projects. And not to put too much on our colleagues at all, because I know they've all been working so hard, but I would say that there's a few things that I hope that we're, we are going to be able to gather from some of the pilot studies that are currently being done. And so number one, we know that as we've been talking about SDOH, different people define it differently. There's different domains. There's different explanations and definitions. But I do hope that we will land on creating standards that are truly fully inclusive and meaningful. And so what I mean by that is as we're developing and thinking about what are those key SDOH data elements that we need to collect, making sure that they are the ones that we need to collect and that they are as comprehensive as possible to really address the health and social needs of patient populations, diverse patient populations throughout the country. And I also hope 
that we're also going to be able through all of this work, and we're starting to see some glimmers of this as well, of incorporating or identifying best practices for the collection and the storage of the data. And this is, I think, really goes back to the design of the various different frameworks that and tools that we're using to collect the data, but making sure that it is continuing to be stored in a safe way to protect patient privacy, but yet in a way that it doesn't prevent the appropriate utilization of that data also. And Interoperability, as Stephen, this is what we all talk about all the time. The interoperability, I think, is going to be so important. And I don't know how it's been with your experiences, but even, for instance, within my institution, one of the things that we have started to overcome some of the challenges of is that if we collect information in one area, some of our other areas of our same institution may not have access to that data due to different kind of views and their different portals and their different instances. So we really need to be able to have that interoperability even within one facility, one system, so that we can make sure that we're providing greatest care, but then also, of course, outside. And that's where I think the Gravity Project is going to have their immense impact is ensuring that we have that bi-directional interoperability between not only those that are providing healthcare services, but those that are providing social services and public health services, because those three connected for SDOH is so incredibly important. So I do hope that we get to that of being able to truly set the standards, develop the technologies, and especially since so much is right now really looking at fire implementations and which we do have that true interoperability behind these entities. And then last but not least, of course, closed loop referrals. How many times that are we referring out for things, but we sometimes do not have those closed loop referrals for services, social services in particular. So those are some of the items that I really do hope that through the incredible work that the Gravity Project is doing, plus all some of the new pilot programs that are starting, will really get to accomplishing some of those items. It's wonderful. So I was thinking about diving into the whole question about privacy and consent mm -hmm. around SDOH data and data collection. One of the things that strikes me is we want to get this information directly from patients, from individuals, and we want them to feel some ownership and comfort with that and with the person or entity that's collecting the data that there, as you say, that there's a need to respect, to keep it secure and to keep it private. But we also, for it to have any value, we need to be able to share it. There is that, that back and forth between privacy on the one hand and the interoperability, the ability to share and utilize that data. How can we approach getting meaningful consent from individuals and helping individuals to understand why we're collecting the data, why they're telling us the information, how it's going to be used. How do we find that balance point around this sometimes very sensitive data? It's all about trust, right? And because of so many factors that have occurred, and I mentioned before just our long history of medical racism and sexism, but I think it's more than that. We've had, as we know, data breaches within our healthcare systems, and we've had so many different challenges. I honestly feel that the public sometimes is, no, why do you need this data and what are you going to do with it? And so I think we have to really start, number one, bringing in the people that we want to try to obtain that trusting relationship with and getting the consent and helping and really allowing them to guide us on the next steps. I am a huge proponent of not only focus groups, but most importantly, advisory groups, and which really getting together teams of individuals that would be our primary focus and saying, how do you think we should do this? What are the challenges that you see? How would you recommend that we address our patients or their families or their caregivers? What type of language should we use? Who should deliver the messages? I think that our patients are the experts. And too often, we all try to do and create these structures or these screening tools or these consents in our own kind of siloed environment and not include the people and not center the people who are the most important. So that's what I would say. We have to really start being more and more 
patient and family and community focus as we're developing these types of interventions. Because as you mentioned, we have to do it. Like this is now a point that it's so incredibly important for us to really start moving the needle towards equity and improved overall health and well being. But we have to include those that we're trying to serve. Excellent. Couldn't agree more. So let's transition a little bit. You were recently appointed as a co chair of the Health IT Advisory Council, or committee, I should say, of the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT. I'm very happy to have you in that position and a committee on which I serve also. And as you well know, the HITAC, as it's called, has four major areas, target areas of focus. The use of technologies to support public health, interoperability, as we've been discussing, privacy and security, and then patient access to their own data. Tell me a little bit, how do you see your role now with HITECH as a leader of that group in terms of your ability to drive in those areas? And do you have any priorities that you've developed for yourself? Yeah, thank you, Stephen, so much for the congratulations. It's an honor and a privilege to serve. And I do hope that we'll be able to continue along the wonderful journey that I think HITAC and ONC are already on. And as you mentioned, there have been four target areas, but we're now introducing the fifth target area, since you're definitely also have contributed so much to HITAC and even to our annual report. So we now have the design and use of technologies that advance health equity since one of the primary priorities of ONC has been health equity by design. And so making sure that now with all that we're doing, we're using and incorporating that equity lens as we develop new policies, new technology, new frameworks, so that it's not an afterthought. So I think already that HITAC and ONC have been doing a fantastic job of already starting to incorporate equitable principles into each of the other four target areas. A perfect example is that in terms of the use of technologies that support public health, we all learned during the pandemic the significant lesson that really it was the severe inequities that we were seeing was clearly in specific communities. It was in low-income communities and low-income communities of color. And those were also the communities, as we know, that may not have as much of a robust public health system. And, all, and we saw the same thing in our other rural areas, too. So it may not have as much of a public health data support system. And the data systems themselves were not integrated enough in order to prevent, as well as to identify, treat, and to monitor this crisis. And so I hope that with my new appointment as co-chair, that we continue down this road of making sure that as we're building out those new standards or recommending new standards for the country, and as we're recommending new technologies or focus or foci for the country, that equity is truly integrated and baked into all of that. And that it's not just, for instance, again, something that's peripheral. And I think we're moving in that direction. I've been very pleased. I'm very excited to see all of the wonderful engagement and the wonderful ideas that have come from all of our high-tech colleagues. So looking forward to more of that. I'm certainly looking forward to your time at the helm there. One of the things that we've been involved in at high-tech and at the ONC is the development of the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, or TEFCA, which I characterize as the next the next generation of interoperability infrastructure and framework for the country. How have you thought about TEFCA and the promise it holds for addressing some of these issues related to equity that we've been discussing? Do you see TEFCA as a tool that we can use to to move that ball forward or perhaps an impediment? What are your thoughts about TEFCA? I hope it's going to be a strong tool and a strong lever to continue to advance equity. And the reason why I say that is that from my own experiences professionally, one of the things that I've noticed is that if there's not a mandate, if there's not a clear set of guidelines, and sometimes even a clear hammer that comes down, sometimes we don't do what we need to do as an industry. 
And I say that because even historically, we've seen this in so many different areas. So if you think about it, even when it came down to quality or hand washing, we actually had to start having very different regulatory that said, no, you will make sure that you achieve quality for your patient populations. You will make sure that your doctors and nurses wash their hands. Wash and so your hands. <laughs> right? right? It's because before us, no, we don't have to do that. And I feel like that's where we are right now in terms of the transformation as a country with truly not only accepting the principles of equity, but most importantly, continuing to nurture and advance it. So I really think that Tefica is going to be a wonderful lever in order to continue to advance this work by adding structure and clear criteria and guidelines. And then I even believe that in there's even principle six that's really focused on equity in general, in which it, it clearly states states that as we're moving forward with developing new policies that are directly part of TEPCA in general, that these policies have to be created with keeping equity in mind. And so therefore, it's going back to what we just mentioned, as we're proceeding forward, I'm really hoping that the Q hens and so many others are saying, okay, as we're pushing out more of these different, these efforts, will it work for all populations and entities? Is there anybody who's going to be excluded and whether that's due to their size or their capacity or their financial resources or not? And then will this potentially harm anyone? And if we proceed with that equity lens, I think that TEPCA is going to be something to really help to promote greater interoperability, as well as a lot more connection between our various different resources. Great. I love that. We're probably getting near the end. You said you you had someplace else you had to be. I wanted to give you a chance, if you'd like, to talk about the work you do at Contour Health Solution. That's not something that I've heard you talk about before. It sounds very exciting. Want to speak to that and where you see that going? Sure. More than happy to. So Contour Health Solutions is a, a national advisory firm that I actually started back in 2017. And the idea behind Contour Health Solutions is that what we specifically do is that we service the subject matter experts and directly partner with health technology companies, investors, as well as other health companies in order to ensure that all the new solutions or the new efforts that these entities are creating, that they're done, of course, with an equity lens and making sure that these medical services are both high quality, high value, efficient, and really are addressing the needs of specific diverse communities. And this all came about the company itself when I was at the MLK Community Hospital. And this is one thing, Stephen, I'm not quite sure that we even discussed. That's what really started my love for IT. So I was actually the very first quality executive to be recruited to build the new Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital in South Los Angeles. And this was a Greenfield Hospital. And I came on board to actually help to create the quality patient safety risk management processes within the hospital. Part of that was also being the very first physician informaticist in order to help implement the Cerner system that was going to be there at the hospital and the clinics. And so that was where my love for health IT came into play. So I not only served as the primary physician informaticist to help design and fully execute the Cerner system, but I was also responsible for providing oversight of the enterprise-wide technologies to ensure that they were safe and that they also made sure to address the needs of our population. And if, for those of you all that may not know about the South LA community, it's by far one of our most under-resourced communities in Los Angeles and within California. And it's highly diverse and with several different languages as well. But the needs of the community tend to be very different from the needs of other populations. So that's what started my work in health IT, but also the intersection between health IT and equity. So what occurred was that I had two little boys at around that time, and they just needed a little bit more time with me. So after I helped to build and open and and also get MLK Community Hospital certified and accredited by CMS and Joint Commission and help to run the hospital, I decided to step away in order to build and launch Contour Health Solutions. And it's been a wonderful company and a wonderful set of opportunities.
opportunities to be able to work directly with various different health tech companies as well as investors and say, hey, if you really want to impact this population, these are the things that you have to think about. This is the way that I would recommend for you to actually build your technology. And here's other things that we can do to actually make an even greater impact, which will not only improve health outcomes, but also improve all of your profits. So that's what Contour Health Solutions is all about. We have a team of several physician subcontractors from various different disciplines, as well as a group of nurses that also participate. So it's been great. And we are continuing to do work both nationally and globally. That's great. I love the name Contour because it acknowledges the fact that every individual, every community has its own characteristics. It has its own contour. You have to create solutions that that address and fit fit those needs. So it speaks volumes just in that one choice of word. You picked up on it, Stephen. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. wonderful. Madel, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you today. Is there anything else that, that you think we ought to touch on? Any questions you have for me? I know we, we have other opportunities to talk, but since we're here in this venue... Sure. Well, Stephen, this is one of the first times we've been able to speak since you've had your amazing new role as Chief Medical Officer at Health Barella. So again, I want to say congratulations again to you. And I will just ask one simple question. What's your vision for your role as CMO at Health Gorilla? And where do you see Health Gorilla actually continuing to evolve to it and make an impact? Because I've already seen the great work that you all are doing and looking forward to seeing even more with you as a leader there as well. Thanks, Madel. That, that's a great question. And I left my clinical practice after 30 years because I really wanted to continue to innovate. And I felt like I'd we'd done a lot in my health system with EHRs and patient portals and quality initiatives, but I thought it was time to try something new. So going to industry uh, company like Health Gorilla, where I can have a perhaps a larger impact, but with a smaller team and also different sets of tools. When you're in a large system, it's hard to move the levers. And with a small, nimble team that's really focused on improving the exchange and the use of health data, really focused on helping to support tech and get that up and running and really addressing these issues of equity, public health, et cetera. I think it's a great opportunity. My my initial focus is really to help promote TEFCA moving forward. So I think like you, I'm very excited for its, its opportunities and the possibility. And as I said earlier, I think it's the next generation. I think part of that is also TEFCA as has a fire roadmap, done a lot with the exchange that we've been able to do with historic technologies and the new FHIR framework, I think, is going to allow us to be more exacting in the data we're exchanging and more effective. So it's a great opportunity for me to explore all of that. And and like you, hopefully advancing equity and the entire quintuple aim for healthcare, improving the health of the population, the experience of patients, the experience of providers, the value of the care we provide, and of course, the equity itself. Absolutely. That sounds wonderful. And Stephen, as my friend, anything I can do to assist, more than happy to do. Thanks so much.